Rogues Gallery Uncovered Bad Behaviour in Period Costume A non-judgmental hornpipe accompanying the scandalous lives of history's greatest libertines, lotharios and complete bastards. This podcast contains adult themes, a touch of colourful language and several blatantly nautical references. If words such as mainbrace, mizzenmast and spigot make you feel uncomfortable, then please reconsider your listening choices. Yo ho ho! Docking in as many ports as possible with 18th century naval Casanova, Admiral Augustus John Hervey, 3rd Earl of Bristol. Ha Now before we begin, a, what I'm happy to say is becoming a regular roguish shout out to a listener who drops me a line about the podcast. Keep them coming. In this case, it's Andre Steenberg, who got hold of me via Simon at roguesgalleryonline.com, addresses in the show notes, and I'm assuming Andre is based in South Africa, as in answer to my request for non-European rogues last episode, he gave me a fabulous list of South African ones. Cheers, Andre. So, soldier, big game hunter, journalist and spy Frederick Fritz Juberg Duquens is now in the list, as is cattle and horse thief, ladies' man, dealer in illegal diamonds, smuggler and friend of the poor, George St. Leisure Lennox, and infamous bank robber, Andre Stander. I really appreciate you taking the time to research and uh, send me those suggestions, Andre. And if anybody else has any non-European rogue suggestions they'd like to send my way, I'd be very, very happy. You can get in touch via the website, roguesgalleryuncovered.com, link is in the show notes, or email me directly. Right. I hope you've got your sea legs because the following tale is written in the present tense of the period in which it's set, and as such may contain certain attitudes and opinions of the protagonists and their times which would today be considered unacceptable. As I'm not a swashbuckling 18th century naval adventurer and Lothario, although I will admit to often wishing that I was, those attitudes and opinions are obviously not mine. Genoa, 1755. Captain Augustus Hervey is in a darkened room, hiding under a married lady's bedclothes. The lady in question is lying in the bed next to him. She is tantalizingly close, but the young naval officer can't allow his eager fingers to explore further because her husband who is completely unaware of the lecherous presence lurking beneath his marital sheets, is approaching the foot of the bed with a lighted candle in his hand, asking his wife if he can perhaps just come a little closer in order to show her some Indian handkerchiefs. There is, it must be said, no acceptable nautical phrase for this particular situation. Hervey himself is not the handsomest of fellows, but he is well-connected, has a very generous purse, enough self-confidence to fill a ship of the line, and acts upon his whims without delay or fear. This, combined with a libidinous appetite which would frankly shame a rampant stag, has made him a coxman of extraordinary success and of which Great Britain can justifiably be proud. Breathing with difficulty and trying to look as flat as possible, not easy under the circumstances, the English Casanova lets his mind drift back across a naval career that was no less active on land as it was at sea. Florence, 1748. Ah, Florence, the temperate climate, the famous bridges and the art treasures of the Medici. Within days of his arrival, Hervey determined that Florentine husbands were not as possessive in their nature as other Italians. This was indeed fortuitous because one of his favourite pastimes of an evening was to escort a great many of their wives down to the bridge at La Trinita. Underneath its arches, on the banks of the Arno, was where the amorous Florentines often gathered to indulge in clandestine knocking, and easy access clothing was the norm. If the husbands had been the jealous type, 
they might have been concerned by the fact that Hervey usually took his walks completely naked, save for a silk robe and a straw hat. <laughs> Whilst in Florence, Hervey also spent a great many happy hours entertaining female company in the secluded shrubbery of his expatriot friend, Mr Mann. Mann had worked hard to transform his expensive Italian lawns into a replica of the infamous pleasure gardens at Vauxhall. That was until scandal and concerns about shadowy debauchery forced him to put up some lanterns. Great days. Lisbon, 1748. Ah, Lisbon. Basking in the Portuguese sunshine, the perfect place for Hervey to reacquaint himself with Signora Elena Paghetti, the lady who took his virginity during his first visit as a callow 16-year-old. They discussed how they'd fared in the years since and then picked up exactly where they'd left off. Fortunately, she was still very handsome. <laughs> Hervey also made a new friend in the lively Spanish form of the Duke de Bagno. These two sons of Venus spent much of their time together frequenting a popular brothel, or nunnery, called Odivelas. With upwards of 700 nuns to choose from, including two royal mistresses, Hervey found his spiritual needs more than well attended. De Bagno also introduced Hervey to a Portuguese style of courtship which involved wearing a voluminous cloak to conceal one's identity and then standing beneath a lady's window whispering sweet nothings in the hopes of being invited up. Hervey tried this approach with one Signora Brezio, and although it took him a few nights of aroused loitering, he eventually got permission to shimmy up her foliage and divest himself of his cloak and shoes and breeches. His greatest cloaked moment, however, came in the company of de Bagno and a French gentleman by the name of Monsieur de Vachene. All similarly attired, they visited upwards of 30 houses of pleasure in a single, very busy morning. It's fair to say that at the end of that, a feeble nor'westerly would have blown Hervey off the edge of the dock and into the River Tagus. Good times. Paris, 1749. Ah, Paris. The beautiful gardens of the Tuileries, the dazzling art collection of the Palais Royal, and the opulent splendour of the French court. On his arrival, Hervey was presented to King Louis XV and the Queen, who both completely ignored him. Madame de Pompidou, however, was more convivial and the handsomest creature I think I ever saw. But sadly, she was immune to the Hervey charm. Within weeks, he was spending his money like a sailor on shore leave, which, to be honest, is exactly what he was, and ingratiating himself with the cream of Parisian society. One such example was Madame de Montconseil, who caught his eye when, as a favour for his mother, he stopped off at her apartments to deliver a letter. To his great disappointment, her gratitude did not extend beyond saying simply, merci. Hervey was further disappointed when, in a fervour of the most genuine affection, he offered an actress known as the Corolina 17 shillings for a quick dock, but was firmly and unequivocally rebuffed. Zutalo. As a staunch patron of the arts, however, Hervey was not one to admit defeat and turned his attention from the theatrical stage to the opera. He began regular and exhausting assignations with two operatic dancers, known as the Belno and the Lani. He was fond of the Belno, a handsome woman whose younger sister was on intimate terms with his new friend, the Duke of Chartres, but less enamoured of the Lani, who claimed that she'd been a virgin until they met. As a gentleman, Hervey paid both her and her mother a considerable sum of money to compensate for the loss of her virginity, but suspected that he'd been gulled, so the designing little trollop was soon sent packing. A visit to the Chateau de Bagatelle did, however, reacquaint him with Madame de Montconseil, who had reconsidered just how grateful she actually was for receiving that letter and gave the pleasantly surprised sailor an intimate tour of her boudoir. Oh, and then there was Madame Coupe, a most luscious jouissance, whom he saw every night for over a week before becoming bored. Mademoiselle Blotin, 
whom he took to bed as her chaperone mother snoozed on a couch in the next room. Baron Blanche, a great black lewd woman, about 30, who gave him little choice but to become intimate, despite his grave misgivings. Madame de Mirancourt, who made a great show of being shy and virtuous before spending all night with him. Throughout this time, he was also still regularly seeing, too, both the Belno and Madame de Montconseil. So it's little surprise that he fell ill during a party at St. Cloud and under doctor's orders was purged, sweated and bled until he felt restored. When he met Madame Casey, however, he knew that it was something special. He immediately stopped seeing Madame de Montconseil, who upbraided him in a most violent manner and generously passed the Belno on to one of his friends after giving her some money for a nice dress. Madame Casey was married, but this didn't stop Hervey pursuing her with the kind of single-minded determination which would one day build the empire. He engineered spending all of his time in her company and showered her with trinkets such as a locket with a secret compartment which concealed a miniature of his face. She finally succumbed, and when he presented her with a single ruby set with diamonds, her passions became delightfully inflamed until her mother walked into the room unannounced and clothing was speedily rearranged. Shortly afterwards, a frustrated Madame Casey declared that she was her own mistress and instructed Hervey to visit her alone in her rooms one afternoon. So before you could say, Hervey, do you ever do any actual sailing? He was banging hard at her door and stayed until after midnight, remarking later, I never tasted such exquisite delight, nor was I ever more fit for the scene. Their affair blossomed, with Hervey enjoying exhausting five-hour sessions in her company. They attended church together, for propriety's sake, and Hervey was shocked to hear her declare before God that she would bestow her favours on no one else but him. He rightly considered that Madame Casey's husband would probably suspect something was amiss when his dutiful wife suddenly started refusing his demands in bed. This turned out to be true, yet despite seething with suspicion, Madame Casey's husband had no actual proof of her indiscretions, apart from a very close call when he saw her kissing Hervey as they stood next to a horse. Brimming with indignation, the furious spouse strode over to remonstrate, and in a moment of swift nautical thinking, Hervey placed a firm muff from the horse's saddle in front of his crotch, concealing the fact that he'd been getting far more than a simple peck on the cheek. Sulkily, the luckless cuckold returned to his lodgings. Happy memories. Genoa, 1755. Ah, Genoa, its famous lighthouse, its doctors who took care of Hervey's hand when he punched his impertinent steward full in the face, and most delightfully of all, Madame Brinold. She was young, rich, married, of course, but Hervey had set his sights upon her and had succeeded in enjoying her favours during numerous snatched moments. This, however, was not enough, and he insisted upon spending at least one full night with her and hang the risks. Which is why, after complaining of an eye infection during a soiree at which Hervey himself was a guest, she retired to her darkened room to sleep alone. Hervey made his apologies to her husband and the assembled company and left soon after returning by an open window to burrow under her bedclothes and wait for everyone else to go to sleep. The husband's show of concern and fascination with handkerchiefs could have ruined everything, but Madame Brinol pleaded that she was in too much discomfort and insisted that he leave her be. He graciously complied, and Hervey graciously lay till near daylight and performed wonders. Hervey and Madame Brinol continued with this arrangement for several evenings. Hervey would often spend hours motionless under the sheets while she entertained the dinner guests who her husband insisted adjourn to her room so she wouldn't miss out on the conversation. It certainly is a man's life in His Majesty's Navy. Hervey has become known as the English Casanova. His journals, from which most of this episode's tale is based, details amorous encounters with no less than 58 women, most of them married. 
and it only covers the years 1746 to 1759, so goodness knows how many others there were. He certainly was an eccentric man. In 1752, when in command of HMS Phoenix, he sailed around the Mediterranean with his own shipboard cook and his own band of musicians. It's said that he even kept a pet leopard and an antelope on the ship as he'd been given them as a present in Algiers. But what impressed, stroke pissed off I imagine, his crew the most was the fact that he installed one of his mistresses and her maid on the ship to keep him company on those windy nights. Mademoiselle Sarrazin, he said, was a delightful fine woman, cheerful and ready to oblige. He managed to keep her on board for six whole months. Nice one. He didn't spend all of his time shagging, however. Hervey served during the Seven Years' War between the UK and France and witnessed the frankly heartbreaking sight of a total English naval defeat at the Battle of Menorca. This was especially galling for him as, in the run-up to the battle, Hervey had captured many French merchant vessels and these were being held in port at Menorca. He was due a not inconsiderable fortune in prize money, but the dastardly French decided to attack the island and get their ships back. Admiral Bing, who was in charge of the English fleet, was tasked with defeating them, but, owing to, in part, widespread sickness among his sailors, couldn't get the upper hand in battle and retreated to Gibraltar. Hervey watched as Bing's reputation and his hard-fought cash bonus sank like a stone into the bottom of the sea when the French successfully captured the island. Hervey, though, clearly wasn't the kind of guy to hold a grudge, because when Bing was court-martialed, he came out in favour of him and was a very vocal supporter. This, sadly for Bing, didn't do him a lot of good, because he was executed by firing squad in 1757, on the deck of HMS Monarch. This name, by the way, is a little ironic, as the court-martial recommended leniency for Bing, and it was only because King George II was in a bad mood with Prime Minister Pitt at the time that the sentence was actually carried out. Now, despite all of his rampant womanising, you may be surprised to learn that Hervey was in fact married to a woman named Elizabeth Chudley, who had a very high position at court. The two had secretly wed in the 1740s, and because Hervey was away all the time and, frankly, quite brazen about his womanising, Elizabeth took her fair share of lovers too. Obviously, though, when Hervey found out, he was absolutely livid, and he resolved never to speak to her again. And he didn't. He finally found some level of contentment, though, after his naval career had ended, when he entered into a very long-term relationship with a former artist's model named Mary Nesbitt. She also had a reputation for promiscuity in her youth, just like Hervey, and had connections with the infamous Hellfire Club, of which we will be hearing about in a later episode. In fact, under her maiden name, she was known as Hellfire Davis, so she seems like a perfect match for an ageing rake. For the full ins and outs of his life in the Georgian Navy, I can heartily recommend this book. August Hervey's Journal, The Adventures Ashore and Afloat of a Naval Casanova, edited by David Erskine. I'm tempted to make a crass remark about Hornblower at this point, but I'll refrain. Next time on Rogue's Gallery Uncovered. Because you demanded it. Dildos, defamation and disguise. England's greatest libertine, peddling filth and pushing his luck with the rogue's rogue, John Wilmot, 2nd Earl of Rochester. This might be a two-tale in one episode special, so for double the fun, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast on your platform of choice and, of course, tell your disreputable friends. Now, during the next fortnight, while I'm elbow-deep in restoration smut and bawdy poetry, I'll also be trying to set up an Etsy shop for my Rogues Gallery Uncovered merchandise. If you're a regular listener to the podcast, you'll know that as this involves technology and I'm a Luddite with a very short temper, it will probably not go quite as planned, so expect a somewhat frazzled Simon in the next episode. If you do want to peruse the merch shop, by the way, you'll find a link in the show notes or visit roguesgalleryuncovered.com. So far, it's t-shirts and mugs, featuring eye-catching titles from some of your favourite episodes. You can look a real Jim Dandy with drunkenness, blasphemy and mime emblazoned across your chest while sipping from an everything-is-more-fun-in-period costume mug. What a way to enter spring. And on that note, I'm off to do battle with the 21st century. Have a great fortnight, stay roguish, stay in touch. Simon at roguesgalleryonline.com and I'll see you yesterday. <laughs>